it's brutal. I believe it. I believe it. But hey, you know what? They're cute, they're cuddly, and they're low maintenance. So yes, they are. <laughs> I enjoy. And if you want to, the great thing about them, if you want to have a getaway for a weekend, you can just leave them in the house. Just leave plenty of food, empty litter boxes. You're good to go. Unlike a dog, you got to find a babysitter. That is so true. I was telling my wife the other day, I was like, I feel like, yeah, so cats are good for that reason. On the same token, if you actually have to leave for a certain period of time, the amount of people that actually want to watch a cat is pretty low. Because, you know, like a lot of people are allergic and like, who wants to scoop poop out of a thing? Because if you're babysitting someone's dog, like they just go poop in the yard and chances are you're not cleaning it up. So it's just, I don't know. It's just funny how it works. It is. It is. (laughs) So, Yeah. But how's your uh, how's your morning been going so far? Ah, uh, fantastic! It's actually, I mean, it's a nice sunny day today. So I, you know what? As soon as the sun comes out and we wake up in the morning, having a cup of coffee and seeing the sun rise, Ooh. you know it's going to be a good day. That's true. I mean, that's something about that. And uh, you know, I might be over always an optimist, but I always feel you know every day is an opportunity mm-hmm. to make someone's life better, or just make a change, learn something new. And whatever happened yesterday, just keep that behind us. Just keep moving forward. How about yourself? Uh, Pretty good. So I did not wake up early enough to see any sun rising, but uh, it was still earlier than normal. And so that felt good. Um, I've been having like trouble, like falling asleep recently. So it's been like really challenging to wake up early. And I I don't know why, Um, but uh, it's like my, it's like I can't turn my brain off at night which is really what it's boiled down to. So that's been a little frustrating. But other than that, it's been a successful morning. And, you know, I went and was able to go grab coffee and get some work knocked out. And uh, every once in a while, I just have to remind myself, uh, I live in America and I'm, you know, getting cups of coffee at, at you know, at random uh, without thinking much about it. And that's uh, a lot better position than a lot of other people are. And so that's something to be grateful for and uh, no, excited is- about. So. You know, it's all the small things in life, and actually, I, actually, I found a little trick. I had the same problem. Can I, can I actually fall asleep? There's always so many different thoughts and ideas running through my head. Mm-hmm. So I started keeping a little notepad next to my bed. So just basically, I got an idea, I'll write it down. You know what? Get it out of my conscious mind and have my subconscious work on it. Just write it down and just move forward. And actually, that helped me. And it's like, okay, it's written down. I'm not going to forget about it. I can. I can do it tomorrow. Right. That That is probably something I should do because um, like the phone, if you have your phone near your bed to do that, I feel like it's always tough because then you like see notifications or like whatever else. And so it's just, it's so much easier to do the, uh, the notepad yeah. thing. Well, so, who doesn't anymore? Yeah, it's true. It's true. So, um, nope. But yeah, so let me uh, let me introduce you kind of to, to kick it off, and then uh, we can just kind of dive into the conversation. How's that sound? I think it sounds great. Yay. Well, good. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Death of Vanilla podcast, and I am so excited to have Rich on here. Uh, his business is called Grow Barra, and uh, I'm not, I'm not going to try to say your last name properly, so. <laughs> you can you can say it right when you introduce yourself, but uh, he launched his business really in the middle of the pandemic, um, doing a small business. Uh, ad, sorry, advisory. I'm going to start over. We'll re-edit that. I don't really start over very often, but <laughs> not a problem. Um, but yeah, he launched his business, uh, Grow Barra, in the middle of the pandemic, and he advises small businesses uh, in a multitude of ways. Right, so. Uh, growth ideas, innovation, creativity, developing strategies. In reality, both him and I are on the same page on this. Rarely we're turning dreams into reality um, because small businesses really are the the blood. They're like, what, like a half to three quarters of all of the jobs in America. And so it's, it's a huge market. It's really important that they do well. And at the heart of things, a small business is really someone's dream that they're hoping is going to become reality. And uh, you, to be honest, you're walking into it and you don't really know if it is. And so someone like you walks in, right, and helps them refine, develop, and execute on those dreams in a way that's actually going to make business sense. So that's my long introduction for you. But if you want to add and throw in anything else, 
then now's your time. <laughs> I don't think I can top that introduction. So uh, the only thing I will actually add is my last name, uh, Rich Baranowski. And a lot there of people go. Call me, I actually go by Richard too. I've been called worse than that before. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I like to just go with Rich. Uh, and to be honest with you, you just nailed it. With a small business, I'm a true believer they're a heart and soul of any thriving economy. So if you want to have a thriving economy, thriving community, you got to actually support your small businesses. And there's actually multiple different ways you can do it. You can actually go locally shopping to the different restaurants. You can actually take a look at uh, the tag. Where was it made? I mean, if we're living in the States, okay, was it made in the States? Was it made in a neighboring country? Maybe even, a, even supporting uh, from a standpoint of doesn't cost any money and such little effort is give them a review on social media, throw in a comment. It's such an, there's so many different ways we can support them that keeping the money locally, keeping the money in the community and the stronger, the more financially healthier they become, guess what they do? They reinvest, they create jobs. And I just saw an article today about UK they're obviously going through the pandemic, just like every other country. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to have to hire over 100 small businesses specifically are going to have to hire over 400,000 jobs wow. to return to the pre-pandemic trajectory. I mean, and let's just think about this. UK, it's a much smaller country than the United States. So what levels are we talking about here in the States? So that's why seeing what was going on with the lockdowns. And, you know, before rumors were coming around, different states have different levels of lockdown. And we're talking about the lockdowns. I totally get, I, I understand why we're doing a lot of things, but at the end of the day, it's like, okay, how are we helping them? Right. What are we gonna do? I mean, which business can actually thrive being locked down for a month, two, three months. Then after that, okay, you can only introduce 10 or 20% of the clientele inside. But that's where the creativity comes in. The ones that actually are going to survive and thrive, that's where the innovation, the creativity comes along. That's actually where you actually start touching on the founders and the employees' uh, mindset, mm -hmm. which I love your title. I love your title, The Death Thank you. to Vanilla. Love it. Well, and I think it's funny. I think in a lot of ways, we're probably using – uh two different ways of describing the th the same thing right so um you know i kind of look at death of vanilla as like doing something out of the box right to gain attention which is really very similar if not the same as innovation in which innovation is let's look at a new way of doing things let's change how we're doing things so that we can continue to evolve so i feel like on my end how I look at it is mine is very like client facing, whereas yeah. you're almost like really changing the internal engine of the company itself so that it's changing so that it can create new products, new services and services customers in a better way. Uh, would you, would you say that's accurate? I would say that actually that's, uh, that's spot on, I think basically. And I don't think those two things are exclusive. I think they're fully dependent on one another. You cannot have one without the other. So I think if one fails, the whole thing fails. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, getting going out there being bold, right? Having good marketing campaign or doing something, you know, a real-time marketing, something happens out there, I'm going to capitalize on that opportunity. Well, you're creating some kind of impression. You're creating some sort of a promise, expectations, what the customers can expect to see. Well, if you can't deliver on that promise, guess what? Well, the, the hard work being bold just failed. Yeah. So it, it, it's like it's a perpetual circle. You always continuously be bold, follow through, and then basically, okay, what's the next thing I'm going to do? And it just continuously got to feed. Um, I'll just use the term that feed that beast that keeps keeps just uh, growing and uh, capture, capturing a larger market share. Right. And, and so I love to pick your brain because obviously you work with a lot of small businesses and you brought up a great point. And it's something that uh, we're dealing with in Arizona because Arizona has opened up a lot faster than some of the other places and certainly not as much as, as Florida. So we're going through right now what I think a lot of other states are going to go through, which is that we are open to full capacity again. 
but most businesses can't actually handle full capacity because they don't have enough workers to actually deliver on that. So you walk into you know a Red Robin, which is not a local business. So, but but you know yeah. you walk into a Red Robin, they they can have all the tables open. They don't have enough servers. So my question for you is is how have 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 business owners been talking to you about that, and how have you helped them innovate? the change that they need to go through because I'd imagine the, the solution is to become an attractive business to work for. Yes. Right. So have they been talking to you about that and how have you helped them navigate innovating where now it's almost like um, they need the employees more than the employees need them kind of scenario. Yeah. And that's, that's a touch. Uh, that's a touchy subject. Uh, they are fine. They have a hard time finding talent. And a lot of times what I actually we talk about is actually initially it's a lot of times you got to get back into the basics. Where did you find your initial employees first? Hmm. Um, you currently do have certain employees, but you actually need to um, load up on some more to actually, you're almost like rescaling the business again, starting from scratch because whatever was working during the pandemic, during the lockdown, well, a lot of a lot of businesses starting doing pickups well and there was a very healthy revenue stream you don't want to let that go you right. want to continue that but the thing is that's not the servicing arm that you have to manage on top of the clientele coming in so if you come back to 75 100 percent or even the pent-up demand people were not bring stuck in the house for a year year and a half now, a lot of people, I just need to get out. I never went out to restaurants. By now, I'm going to start going to restaurants because I've been stuck indoors. Yeah. So there's going to be this pent up demand. You might get actually, so how do you handle it? Well, the employees you have, you got to start working with the employees. It all starts with your number one asset, the people within your organization. And it always starts with the mindset. Your number one a- asset is customers, yes, because they pay the bills. But your number one asset internally are your employees. Mm -hmm. Engage with them, talk to them. Do they have friends, family members? Do they know anyone who might be interested? Because you know what? They understand the culture within your organization. They are your best ambassadors for your company. Because putting out an ad in the paper, I'm I'm, I'm aging myself, or putting uh, an ad online on Indeed, well, it doesn't tell, but it doesn't say anything about the, the culture, how they're being treated, about the benefits, what's the environment, what's the training. But the employees, they've been around with the company for the longest period of time, don't know exactly what is going on. So use that asset. And that's number step number one. You still want to follow through, starting to find employees out there on the outside. But at the same time, engage your employees. So I look at a two-pronged approach. One, create ambassadors, where they can actually do the marketing for you. Step number two, which is often forgotten, is embrace a form of partnership, a partnership from a standpoint where they can actually identify opportunities where to grow growth. A lot of people when they say growth, oh, I got to go social media. I need followers and all that. No, no. Growth, a lot of times, there's, there's a full spectrum of it. Growth is internally. Okay, how do we actually become more efficient? What do we can we what kind of layout do we have to do? What can we do more with what we currently have? I actually I read a book a long, long time ago. Uh, there was a Japanese uh, director of manufacturing and he had a production line, right? And he had a hundred people working on a production line. Well, and there was a certain output that he, at the end of the shift. So what he did, cut the labor force in half. Now you got 50 people, but expect the same output. Well, the output and the quality dropped. The people they're working on the line, he worked with them. They got it back up. Once they got the back up to the same standard, guess what he did? Cut it down in half again. Right. And he kept doing that until they exhausted all creative ideas, potential opportunities to actually back, get the output and quality to the original state. So then he knew, okay, all I need to do is bring up the few people just to give me that over the edge. So right. the same thing has to happen internally with the small businesses. If I have a staff, if I, if I have a number of line cooks or anything internally, do, do the same approach. Embrace them, embrace their creativity, and give them the tools 
and the freedom to try new things because the one there's two things with ideas one idea by itself has zero value unless you test it when you test it you find the viability of it and that's where the magic happens i love that what do they say uh graveyards are full of ideas <laughs> uh, yeah but no that makes that makes uh, that that makes so much sense and i love that it's just I, I I really do think businesses forget that their employees are the ones that are really on the pulse of what's happening there. And if you have a situation where employees are never recommending anyone to work there, <laughs> then then you've got a culture problem. And yes, that is actually going fixing that will actually probably fix a lot of other problems. But I think. So your example on the Japanese um, manufacturing line, I love that example because it kind of reminds me a little bit about like when when people are first taking the like steps in marketing or building a business, you know, a lot of times, you know, they're going for those big loans. They're trying to get VCs to give them lots of money, which I totally get. You got to have a certain amount of capital to work with to, to get the ball rolling. Um, but there's something to be said about bootstrapping because you learn to get creative. It's like you said, like if you only have $2,000 a month for a marketing budget or 10,000 or whatever the thing is, sure. You're not going to have the results of a company that has a million dollars a month, but at the same time, you're going to get super, super effective at what you have to work with. Um, you know, and, and for you, I'm sure it's like you working with companies that have five employees or 50, they've got to get creative about how they're actually doing business. And actually, a lot of times I see the, uh, you know, uh, companies and startup, they get like the series A, well, they got $5 million. A lot of times, to be honest with you, I see the money as, as their enemy to growth. Mm. Because I think it develops a certain level of complacency. All of a sudden, hey, I got $5 million. I can do, I can start running campaigns, ads, and all that stuff. Then my creativity goes down. Well, why do I need to be creative? And my personal story where I actually truly learned creativity is actually I'm an immigrant. So I came to this country from Poland when I was 10 years old. Okay. And not knowing the language at all with my parents. My parents immigrated. Um, it's a long story. But we had no money. So my mother, you know, I remember she was cleaning houses just to make ends meet, uh, not knowing the language, not making a lot of money. And what I saw her do with every single dollar and every single penny, making that stretch, getting creative, not, you know, so there's a meal for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day. That's where I actually truly picked up on the creativity because it's like, wow, no money, a lot of energy. And you just got to figure it out it, because it's one of those things. It's like you either eat or don't eat. Simple as that. And I've only had $20 for a week. Guess what? I have to stretch that out. I can't just go out on Monday to a restaurant, get a pizza, go the $20. Guess what? There's six more days. So startups have to think about the same way because it's not a sprint. You, you know this. It, it's a mm -hmm. marathon. A lot yeah. of people talk about it's a long journey. It's a marathon. So the marathon runner, the first mile, he goes all out. Guess what, what's going to do with the uh, remaining 24 plus miles? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a, all about comes down to creativity. It's, that's, and small business owners, what the biggest thing, they, the problem they have is we talk about all those different things is time. They're already probably running 16 hours a day doing all the running in the business. Who's looking out for on the business? It's tough. It's true. So what I would love to take this is, you know, you talked about ideas are important. Uh, mm -hmm. Ideas of themselves are useless uh, with the, you know, unless you're doing something with them. So do you have a framework that you guide business owners through to be able to take that idea and begin testing it and implementing it in their business? Yes. Uh, there's depending on the situation or the challenge and depending what they want to achieve, there's, there's, there's many different tools that I can apply. And sometimes I just intertwine the different tools. Um, so the two big distinction 
that I want to just mention is, first of all, I think a lot of times, a lot of corporations mention, oh, we got to improve innovation, innovation, innovation. My personal take, I don't think they know what they're talking about. <laughs> because here's the way I view it. There's two things. There's creativity and there's innovation. You can have creativity without innovation. You can't have innovation without creativity. Yes. Because creativity is just the concept of letting just boosting your imagination to new frontier, exploring new ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Doing the uh, what, what if questions. The innovation, innovation is just the process. Innovation is the process of if I create this idea and I just run this idea through my innovation process to at the end of the day, I just want to have a unique solution for my customers. So then through the innovation process, what we would like to do is very simple from design thinking is the first step is actually let's just start bombarding the challenge with ideas. You know, you basically, you just diverge. Any wildest idea, then you start converging and uh, weighing some of the ideas. Then basically the next phase is to the experimenting it. And it could be, you know, you know, they want to try out different channels for marketing, different content, different product. Uh, what happens if we remove something? What about what happens if we add or combine or different phases? Because depending if you're working on something, a physical product or just the software, but at the, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if I'm selling a widget or if I'm selling a service like a SaaS software out there. Mm -hmm. It's what kind of experience am I going to leave with the customer? So then is actually how do you test it? And the way I like to test everything is you want to have initially very crude. Here's the key that too, uh, I see this too often. People create like a prototype and they put so much time and money into the prototype and Steve, I'm going to sell you this product, right? Right. That's the biggest issue. This is the problem that I see is people spend way too much time and money into a prototype because once I actually, let's say I'm building, spend two months building this thing and about $100,000, I allocate, I have so much vested interest in it that I fell in love with it. Then I start selling it to you instead of building something crude, presenting to you to get your feedback to improve it. Right. So keep it simple, just like content. Keep it simple, put it out there, see what resonates, make an improvement, and send it out again. So, so let, let me let me let's hit pause on that and deep dive a little bit in there. So obviously, what you're asking people to do, I feel like is a is a a, a, a pretty big ask emotionally, right? Yeah. You're asking someone to uh, put out something that they may not even be proud of yet. Um, that people are judging them on their quality or their uh, capacity or what have you and and saying like, hey, I think this is good enough for you to make an evaluation of where this is headed. So how do you manage that? Because that has got to be rough to be able to either, I, I don't know, is it rough to talk people over the edge in doing that? Or is there like a process in which you walk them through doing that? Because I totally get that. Like from a, uh, a camera point of view, uh, there was a, ca a camera company called Black Magic that put out a camera that had issues with it. It just did. But at the core, um, you saw that like, hey, like the, the image quality is actually pretty good. And they made updates based on feedback they were getting. So they built trust. So like I, I get that it's the right process. But how do you ask someone to do that for the first time? Well, there's the, there's the personal barriers, right? Yeah. Uh, the originator of the idea, you have to overcome that. And as it becomes crude, you actually start asking specific questions. You kind of, you kind of guide them along. The reason why you actually guide them along with questioning, because you want them to come up to the conclusion, because when they actually come up to the conclusion on their own, they're more likely to follow it. And then testing the idea it's not like you're going to test let's say i have 1000 customers right i'm not going to test it with all 1000 customers right. if i have 
if I'm doing my job right as a business, I have insight on the customers. I know which ones actually are engaging with me continuously. Some of them I might send an email surveys I never hear from them ever. But some of them there's a continuous. So you gotta you gotta a true fan choose who you want to evaluate the part with. And out of that group, you wanna see who can actually which customer can actually see beyond the crudeness of the product who can actually see the potential someone who is a more of a visionary and the best part to do it with customers is also invite them into the development process have them participate and if i if i actually tried that out with 10 customers and i invite them in get in trials if i just do it once guess what i'm getting feedback who out of the 10 people who were truly engaging into the process who actually saw beyond what it, from what it is to what can become. So that is my insight. So the next time I'm innovating, I know exactly who to test, just like developing content. If I actually created one, one piece of content, boom, put it out there, and I'm getting certain engagement, well, I, I, I want to gather that the insight, what actually worked on it. Or do I want to do a buckshot approach? I want to put out 20 or 30 different variances of the same content and see which one resonates. Right. It, it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's always a trial and error. And it's always, you always, you never actually plan to fail, but you should always plan to learn from every failure. That's why you're testing to make it better. See, I think that's awesome. You you have unpacked at least for me, and I, I I would assume I'm not the only one. Um, a very key component of this whole process, which is, you're not necessarily going to market with the idea. You're going to your true fans with the idea. Yes. Ones that you've built a rapport and a relationship with. This isn't a stranger. You're not running a Facebook ad on this. Like you're trying something new with someone who has invested something into your company, but it is not the market at large. And I think sometimes like it's, that's hard to imagine, I think, because um, like I, I can't really send an Instagram post to just some people, you know, I could DM them, but yes. like almost everything that you do, at least on social media and digital marketing, even even regular marketing, like you can't control who gets your newspaper, like physically control it. Like you can't control who drives by a billboard. And so at the end of the day, almost all of like the outward facing things that we do is like to everybody. And so I, I like that idea of drawing it back and having like a, 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 a panel, if you will, of trusted uh, customers, but that are, they're invested. And so that way you have somewhere to test it where your credibility is already established and you're not just like blowing up an idea. And I don't mean like exploding an idea. What I mean is like, uh, um, scaling the idea out to the market at large. And I yes. think that to me, that's the gap that I've never seen filled and, and have people talk about is like, who is it actually getting involved in this innovation process that isn't inside of the company? And, and, that, and that's, that's how, because if you're like a fish, let's say the fish is the basically the, um, I never created this, but I actually saw the concept. So actually a fish goes from a fish tank to a pond, then to an ocean. Like I read a book before, um, like Procter & Gamble. I think everyone knows who they are and how they do testing trials of their products. When they actually create something new, what do they do? They have a store within their HQ mm. where they actually put out the brand new products. They want to get the exposure with the employees and they put it on a different brand mm. to protect Procter & Gamble brands, right? And then, well, if they get positive feedback, what do they do? Then they go to local stores within the town once again to protect their brand. They, they put it out on a different brand and they get the insight. So they slowly evolve the innovation, the new product. They don't basically just straight into the ocean because if it fails, they can't, they're basically tarnishing their brand equi equity. Right. So there, there's two things to look at. One, 
you're going offense, but at the same time, you're playing defense because you got to protect your own brands. So how do I best do it? Like you mentioned, uh, putting out new content out there and getting feedback. Well, there's what about if I actually create a group out there, group on LinkedIn, a private on Facebook with my clients, certain clients that go in there, and I put out new content in there, I notify them, and they basically check it out, provide me feedback, and everything is hidden within that group, unless someone takes a picture of it and things like sure. that. But there are different areas to actually get creative on finding solutions. And the biggest thing is you got a goal, and in order to achieve the goal, there's a lot of challenges in between that. So the question is, how do we actually um, face those challenges, develop strategies to overcome those uh, challenges in order to meet the goal? So I just love the creativity part and innovation and just business in general. See, I, I can talk like this all day long. I just enjoy it so much. <laughs> That's good. Awesome. So, okay. So let's, so let's zoom back out again. Right. And so the, the, the person has an idea, you help them develop the idea. They've launched yep. it into a small, uh, you know, panel or focus group or whatever you want to call it of, of trusted customers. Uh, now let's, let's, let's continue on how, how, what's the next couple steps as far as what innovation looks like inside of a company. So then basically once you get the feedback, the customer feedback is so precious that you got to then, you take that feedback, you highlight all the different feedback you receive. Uh, is it the performance, how it feels, how it made them feel, uh, what they thought about it, opinions, everything. So you're looking at the first order and second uh, order data. And then basically you start drawing some patterns, start developing some patterns. Then based off those patterns, you go back into your product and you make those adjustments. And then what you do, I like to, is basically you go back to the same group. Hey, we listened, here's the feedback. And then what I might wanna do, I wanna expand that group a little bit. I wanna get some fresh perspectives into the group. And then basically you gather the feedback again. So initially when someone starts out with the, um, with the process is we gotta be careful of not trying to strive for perfection. First of all, perfection does not exist. I mean, you show me perfection and I will show you a unicorn, first of all. And a lot of times <laughs> people get paralyzed by that. Just yeah. like going bold out there with content, something radical that might draw a lot of visibility. I never did this before, but see, that's the paralysis. So a lot of times if it's, 85%, 95% good. Oh, hey, go ahead. Now, that's where the strategy comes in because the strategy is depending on what happens in the market, you already have decisions. So if you're starting to gather some feedback, uh, negative feedback or positive feedback, because you already have action plans, how do you tackle that? Because there's two things that could happen. And I think those things are both catastrophic to any business. Number one, if it just blows up and it's just negative, it's just failing nonstop out there, getting better views, what are you going to do? Right. The second issue that I see is just as deadly. What happens if it takes off? You're, let's, let's say you were getting 10 orders a month or a week. Now you get... 10,000, 100,000, what are you going to do? See, spikes, both on the positive or negative side, I think they're both deadly. Because if you cannot fulfill them and you try to fulfill them and your quality drops, you get bad reviews once again. So slow and steady is, that's why taking the approach of launching someone. So if you do have a new product coming out, maybe you don't launch it to the public. Maybe you offer an upgrade to all your current customers first mm -hmm. as an upsell, depending what you're doing. Then you slowly roll it out. Maybe you actually go after niche down, only market, even though you're, this product can be used by a mass, a large group. Mm -hmm. You find that niche within a small group and you slowly scale. Because the one thing that 
no matter how much we try to anticipate, if you actually double in size in the revenue or the demand, how will your quality truly respond? You can actually model everything, but when the rubber hits the ground, you truly don't know what's going to happen. And are you going to, how long does it take to actually um, support? What kind of supporting staff do you have? Because it's not only try to actually create the product and be able to support producing it, but the thing is the servicing part, that's a very important arm out there. What about it? It's like you have content. I like to always reply to all my con to all the comments that I get on social media, right? right? To all the posts that I do. And I can easily manage that, right? I don't get tons of them, but all of a sudden overnight, I started getting like 100, 200 comments on each of the posts on mm. every single channel. That's uh, awesome. Ah, what am I going to do? Just hearts yeah. and just uh, TYs. And I'm like, I usually like to always go, always go a little bit in depth. Yeah. That's my, that's my vision. That's my belief. So I, I would be in trouble. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I never, never thought about it, never planned on it. So that's something I have to overcome that big problem. That's what, uh, uh, I don't know if you follow Gary Vaynerchuk at all, but he always talks about that scaling the unscalable and, uh, what that looks like. And, and yeah, I mean, it, 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 it sucks because I know that I've listened to a lot of podcasts from people who have hit a, you know, a great deal of popularity and, what people eventually come to the conclusion of is like, they're probably not going to respond to me because of how many people like, you know, if, if you go on and you respond to someone who has 10,000 comments on their post, like you ain't respecting the, re you're, you're not expecting a response. And so they're like, you know what, I make a post, I'll spend the next hour of my day responding to the first people who are messaging me, because those are the people who are like following my notifications or just like actively engaged. So those are like the most engaged people on there. If they're responding like within like the first half an hour, it's not like, you know, the, the, you know that at that point the algorithm hasn't even started working. And so, um, so that's how they kind of justified it in their head was just the idea that like if I can spend the next half hour on the post responding to people, then I'm responding to the people who are most invested, and those are the people who are actually going to care the most that I responded. And then if I get to more people later, great. If I don't, then, you know, how can you respond to everyone? You just, you just can't. No, I mean, and, we, and you know what? Guys like Gary V, we got to thank them. We got to thank, <laughs> we got to thank people like that for conditioning the public mm. to expect no responses. Right. Especially once you get to a certain size. Well, I think people respect it because like in the same way for you, it's like you could totally hire someone to respond to people. But like people also know that like if he responded, it's actually him. And if he didn't respond, it's because he's the one typing <laughs> and he's, <laughs> he's running like five companies. You know what I mean? So I think there's I think people as long as you provide context, I think people get it. Um, so, yeah. So, OK, so um, I think we've kind of talked around it a little bit, but I would love for you to talk a little bit more about like what your key role is inside of a business because uh, you know we've we've kind of alluded to the fact that you're a guide for these small businesses uh, but what is it exactly that you're doing when you go meet with them or talk to them resume with them and all the other fun stuff like that no, what's the best way i can put that all right you know golf right you got, I know, do you ever watch Masters and all the professional golfers out there? And uh, I'm like the caddy, right? <laughs> right. That's why I like view myself because let's say you're a professional golfer and I'm the caddy. You know what to do best, right? You, you're the one that has to execute. You're the one that has to do the heavy lifting. You got to swing the club, get the ball into the hole with the few, fewest amount of strokes. My job is to offer a different perspective, to question. Well, Stephen, why are you using the uh, one iron on this hole? I mean, you know, look at the wind. You know, it's uh, it's a little it's a little soft out there, and you might want to maybe loft it a little bit more. You want to be you want to you want to get as close as you can to the pin as possible for basically a short putt. So that's that's my job is actually. 
I evaluate, develop strategies on where they want to actually achieve. So when we mention turning dreams into realities, because every single small business founder, every single business out there starts with a dream, just like Bezos, you know, started in the garage, you know, Gates, mm -hmm. I mean, the list goes on and on. That is a dream. The reality, they're living the reality right now. They're basically becoming behemoths out there in the world. Right. So my job is like offer a new perspective um, because one individual or even fewer individuals, they can only see so many different things. They can only anticipate so many different things. So I like to actually develop challenges for them, gain clarity on the goals, and then making sure that every single goal is interconnected or dependent on one another, on each other towards their vision. So if you're a business owner, you're starting in a hole number one. Okay, what is your goal? Where do you want to get? At the end of the day, after 18 holes, what do you want you, where do you want to be? Well, I need to shoot 10 under par. How do we get there? So then we walk every single step and then then think of every single hole as a goal. And then along the way, if you actually shank the shot, goes in the woods, or in a, okay, what's the best course of action? Do you actually play it safe or can you actually nail it out there? And how do you do it? And if you do miss, do you get yourself in even worse trouble? So then the thing is, if you actually get yourself in trouble in the beginning, how do we recover? So that's the thing. We always talk about all those different scenarios. Uh, listing out choices, making right decisions. So a lot of times, because the business, a lot of times we fall in love with it, with the idea concept, that we kind of like forget about a lot of things, anticipate a lot of different things, what could potentially occur, what could potentially derail your vision, derail your dream. So I kind of keep things in line. I do have a method process that I actually walk through. So if you want to create content, so we talked about going big, right? Mm -hmm. I'm getting going viral. Okay, what happens if you do start getting 100, 10,000 comments every single day? What happens then? What about if you start getting uh, 100 emails every day requ requests? So that's basically a new prospect. Don't forget, you still got to manage current customers. So how, yep. do you, how do you actually find the additional horsepower to get it, up, get it done? How do you get the efficiency? So if you're looking to hire, how do you plan on trying uh, training, onboarding them? So it's you get wrapped up in a business. It's so easy to get wrapped up in a business, especially if it starts scaling a little bit. I'm not talking about even going exponentially, that a lot of things you kind of start, stop seeing what's yeah. happening around you. So that's what I actually bring in. I bring in the questioning. So if we actually go through a, list of questions today, uh, possibilities, working through the, uh, a certain set of uh, directions and decisions. So that's what I, I kind of keep everything in line. I kind of keep trying to keep everything moving along in the right di uh, direction and then anticipate certain pitfalls or challenges that you might uh, occur. It might not happen tomorrow, but it might be two months from now. Like one of the clients that I'm working right now, uh, she is scaling very quickly. Uh, and I mentioned to her, okay, you're doing a great job. You're onboarding a lot of people. Well, who's going to manage them? <gasps> ah, <Rich. laughs> whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. We have a couple months to resolve it before they start becoming like full time. Because the last thing you want to do is actually have. Uh, just come in, try you out one time, and they just ghost you because the there was a disconnect between the expectations that you've given them and delivering on it. Right. Because I always like to look at it expectations. Your customer has expectations. So you under-deliver on expectations. Well, there's a negative gap. It kind of hurts your revenue because they're going to leave, but they're going to probably provide you some negative reviews. Well, there's also the positive expectations. You exceed their experience. Well, that's hitting your profits. Right. So the closer you get, that's the best course of it. I mean, I like to call it hitting that sweet spot. Yeah. But the thing is, that's that's the that's the way it really lines up with my personality. Because everyone's got to find who they are. 
You know, you got to find who you are. Um, and for me, I love doing this because I love not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. And being stuck doing the same thing day in, day out. I know what I'm going to do tomorrow, next year, 10 years from now, get a beautiful career. career. That in my eyes, that it's like death. That's <laughs> So I like the excitement, adrenaline rush. And let's not forget, too, the biggest thing what I try to help them out, too, is gain clarity. Because yeah. every single business out there, every single business out there is a reflection of the founder's personality. Yeah. That when we talk a lot of time, when we talk about, you know, on social media, you know, how do we how do we connect with customer? You know, a lot of people say, well, you got to be authentic out there. What does that truly, what does that mean? I mean, you don't start a business with certain values and beliefs. You know, look inside first. Don't try to copy someone else's and mm -hmm. then portray that because as soon as you try portraying, once, soon, as soon as you find yourself and start using you to market the business and reflect it within the business, you will attract similar customers with similar values. And then the job becomes easier. Right. Well, and I think, gosh, you, you brought up so many good things. So I, I, I feel what you're talking about with the obstacles. I know for me, bottlenecks is something that I'm always watching out for, which is like, if, if this is three times more than what it is now, what does that look like? Uh, because it's so much easier, like you mentioned, to put in a process uh, before it becomes a problem uh, and, and to be honest, I mean, as a small business owner or, or just really anyone that's doing anything successfully, you're always going to feel like you're trying to catch up because if it's growing, you're constantly like managing the growth, uh, which can feel like catching up. Uh, but yeah, having, being able to have someone to think through, through those decisions like you are, I think is huge because yeah, you, you want to be able to see those, those bottlenecks before you get to them. So that when you do, you already have a plan in place, or at least a, a plan that is potentially going to handle that problem. Uh, because like you said, let's be honest, you know, it, it is, there is, uh, hey, we're growing, this is awesome, and our profits are up, and we're growing so fast, we're literally, like your example earlier, what if you go from, you know, 10 to 10,000, well, then you have 9,990 unhappy customers, if you can't deliver. And that's definitely a, a kiss of death for your business, as opposed to like, hey, I went from 10 to 30, and that's a lot of work. Like, yes, you're catching up, you're you're changing your systems, but at the end of the day, like, you'll you'll probably get those 30 people happy, um, and or, you know, or <laughs> at least fewer unhappy ones. Um, so I, I I I love that example. That's that that's wise right there is being able to have you know think ahead and be able to anticipate some of those issues yeah and and one of the things i mean even myself i'm learning is uh that's why it's 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 healthy for me to have clients like also like on an emotional level too because um uh, being a founder or running a business it's a lonely place mm-hmm it's like you're stuck on a deserted island by yourself. So a lot of times it's like, it's always good just to talk to someone. Yeah. Throw something, not, not even just talking about the uh, nuts and bolts of the business, just bounce ideas of someone because it's difficult. It's like, if you have employees, it's like, hey, you know, I, I, I write your paycheck every day, Steve. Here's an idea. Do you think we should do this? I just came up with this <laughs> last night. Well, I think a lot of employees were just not their head. It's like, oh yeah, oh great, fantastic, yeah, go for it. <laughs> right. Or just like, oh, it's not my place to say anything because if it fails, I don't want to take the negative heat uh, off it. So it's having someone to talk to that's not connected directly to the business. I think it is so healthy. It's just like I was just thinking about that a few weeks ago. It's like, you know, as a kid, right? We're, we're growing up, we're going through this journey, preschool, kindergarten, elementary, just going through the life, right? There's right. always, there's someone with us. You got the teachers, you got the parents, you got the friends, you can actually you got a bad day, you can lean on someone. You can, you can uh, 
I want to pursue something. I'm going to rent something by my uh, parents or by uh, by teachers. And like, well, that's excellent, but I see your strength somewhere else. And won't you give this? But as soon as you start a business, you're on your own. You got no one to lean on. You can't really lean on your friends or family members, especially parents. But you can because they're always going to love you for whatever you do. And they're like, oh yeah, great, yeah, go jump off the bridge. Sounds <laughs> great. So it's having another voice another perspective or another set of eyes just keep just guiding you alone that's why i kind of said initially i kind of see myself as a caddy because Mm -hmm. i know what you want to achieve and i just want to guide you there so you don't get yourself in trouble and you do get yourself in trouble all right let's talk it through let's create a strategy so we can get back on towards your vision well i just i feel like everything in business ties to like real life relationships and i feel like that's a great way to like kind of figure out if what you're trying to accomplish um in business uh literally makes sense on any level and so i'm, I'm guessing by the decor in your house that you're married yes uh, yes so so for example the thing that i think about that i often compare stuff to is um moving from dating to married right when you say like hey i'm gonna change my job or hey i think i'd like to go live over there or buy a house or not go to college or go to college like the person you're dating is concerned about you and they love you and care about you but like they're like oh cool like they're so supportive and then you get married and it's like oh like if you decide to change your job like you may not make the mortgage payment and all of a sudden like what you say has a very different impact on the person who was previously very supportive. And uh, it's, I think that whole dynamic is super funny to be honest. Um, but you know, and then you go talk to your guy friends and if you were saying like, hey, like I think I'm gonna do a career change, they can like objectively work through it through you because at the end of the night, they're not sleeping next to you. At the yeah. end of the night, like they're not losing their house, you are. And so uh, they don't have like the same emotional investment into that. And I feel like what you're talking about is like the same. It's like, you're right. It is a lonely island as a business owner, or even just at, even just as a high level leader, because at the end of the day, the dynamic of the relationship is just simply different, and you don't have the luxury of just word vomit because what you say as an owner has impact on your employees because they're counting on you, as oh, opposed yeah. to if they talk to you, if you know if they make a, a you know if they make a crazy suggestion, you're not gonna like storm out. You're not gonna like quit, you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, like it doesn't affect you. Like, I mean, it does, but not in the same way. And so um, if you always tie back, I feel like business concepts with the relationship concepts, uh, you're usually gonna come up with a good solution. And uh, so, yeah, I, I totally feel that. You're, like your position or someone like that is huge for business owner because you are one of the few people that they can be honest with and bounce ideas off of because let's be honest like brainstorming is a messy process and you want to be careful who you're brainstorming with yes yeah and you if you get if you got a founder or basically leader of an organization can you actually just run into the room and rant oh my god we we only got two months to survive come the customers (laughs) suck us i mean uh, no i mean resumes will be going out by the time he leaves the office the resumes will be out the door people will be out the door and there'll be zero faith in the culture or the direction of the company they can't they gotta they, there's a certain persona they have to keep within the office yep so having someone to like you mentioned uh, the guy friends or it's it's very healthy just to have a discussion with them having them throw ideas i mean it's maybe do it without beer without drinking because the perception <laughs> changes it's like you want to right. hey yeah go ahead relocate yeah I... <laughs> very optimistic advice <laughs> yeah exactly but it's so it's 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 big i mean uh, i find it very healthy to be honest with you when i talk to my clients i find it actually very therapeutic for myself too mm. to bounce ideas too i because I, a lot of times i use them to try different thoughts and patterns with them and see how they respond. And the thing is, it's all developing relationships. That's why in business too, that's why acquisition, yes, is important, but retention is so much more critical because when we talked about innovation process and not failing, right? 
that is so big. But if the customer has been around for a while, they understand you. And if you do fail out in the market, they will forgive you. Yeah. Because they know you, what you stand for. They understand that you tried something new, that you will fix it because you fixed in the past. So it's, so is there a true pattern to get everything done? Yes, there's certain tools, um, processes to move forward, but you have to take such a holistic view on everything. So that's why I always try to do my best is to bring that wholesome to the business and just try to keep, I have a whole list of different ideas in different topics that I have to touch on. And we don't touch on everything because that's just basically like drinking from a fire hose is basically tackle one thing at a time. Right. Well, cool. Well, dude, so we're coming up on time. So I just wanted to say thanks for being on the show as a, just a short recap, if I may. Um, uh, and, and I think the, like the biggest big takeaway from really anyways is or for anyone uh, whether they're a director, business owner, um, driving the ship in some way, is find someone to bounce your ideas off of. Find, um, once you develop those ideas, find a group of people who are invested and uh, understand the context of what you're doing to find out. Fix the problems that they see, reshow it to them, plus a couple more people and then go to market with the idea uh, so that way there's like a little bit of process there so that way there is uh, really a better product that's being launched uh, because of your openness to uh, criticism correction encouragement and uh, I, I think that's huge because i think a lot of people just don't have that process to work through and so they end up making a decision based on fear uh, which isn't really grounded in reality because you and I both know that if they stay in the position they're at right now, they will fail eventually because, yeah. it, I mean, look at like like the classic example is Blockbuster. Who would have thought that a place that had as many locations as McDonald's, that's an exaggeration, but you know it feels like they were on literally every single corner is now down to, I think, one store. Um, I think I saw a TikTok that someone went to like yeah. a, a, a blockbuster store and there's like one of them in the entire United States. And it's like, if you would have tried to tell them that if they stuck with their model, they would eventually die. They would have laughed you right out of the room until it happened. Well, no, they believe that to the end. Yeah, they believe all the way to the grave. <laughs> well, yep. it's I mean, not to chuck, not to uh, not to touch on death, but again, but complacency is death. I mean, we live in a hyper competitive world mm -hmm. and you're not innovating. You're not trying new things. You're not trying to be bold. Uh, there might not be room for you. I think the outcome is inevitable. Yes. It's, I think you're in a business. You, you talk to a lot of people, you have seen a lot of things going on and that's, that's the whole essence is one thing that where people should need to start if they want to become bold and getting out there they got to start with themselves so stop playing less in your comfort zone start playing a little bit more in the fear zone because that's where the growth lives Ooh, i love that that's quotable you should make a you should make a piece of content on that today <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's, i will you're right unless you already have in which case just do it again because only like what a third of people see posts anyways so might as well just do it again <laughs> well i do the same post hundred different ways and put it out there there you go well awesome well literally i i really do appreciate you being on the show uh, i appreciate uh going through that innovation is something that is near and dear to my heart uh not only because i believe in it as a person uh but i see it play out every day um both good and bad and so you are right at the heart of that which is making sure that the, the culture and the leadership of the company is in that mindset which to me and for me uh opens up opportunities on a marketing end that they're willing to try new things because if they're set in their ways structurally and internally there's not a chance they're going to do anything externally that's wild and crazy and so I love that you're really prepping the groundwork for someone like me. 
uh, as well as just really, like we talked about, turning people's dreams into reality. And I think that's phenomenal. That's that's something that, that can get you out of bed in the morning. So Yeah, yes, me every single day. Every single day. Well, awesome. thank you for having me on. It was, yeah, you make it uh, very comfortable to actually have a nice dialogue, conversation. It's uh, fantastic. Thank you. Well, absolutely. Uh, can you share... Uh, I will, we'll put this down in like comments and, and, and yeah. stuff like that at the bottom of any video or post we have, but if you could share where people could find you so they can engage with your comment and send you one of a hundred DMS a day. Uh, I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> I want to test you. I want to test your limits here. <laughs> Thank you. No, no. no where, can... where, where can people find you? Well, they can actually go to my website. They can go to growbar.com. They can go to uh, IG. Grobara. Um, I'm also on Twitter by Grobara. And then the LinkedIn, they can find me on uh, Richard Baranowski. B A R A N O W S K I. Nice, simple Polish name. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much.